Hello, and welcome to the VR Report. I am your host, David O, and I'm with the infamous Tony Parisi. Tony, uh, big fan of yours, but I don't think I can give a good enough intro without me just asking about what you've done in the past, and please introduce yourself to the audience. Okay, so my name is Tony Parisi. I have been in virtual reality for over two decades, on and off. Uh, back about 20 years ago, I created something called VRML, the Virtual Reality Markup Language, for defining 3D worlds that you could access over the internet. I was actually working with some folks who were essentially refugees of the first attempt at doing consumer virtual reality, which happened back in the early 90s. They were doing consumer electronics like Sega VR and systems like that. And that just was a very big and visible sort of collapse in terms of VR not taking off then because it was too early for price and all that. So a lot of people got together to work on doing it again, but this time with the Internet. The Internet was starting to come online in the early 90s. And we created this technology for you and I to be able to access the same world online in a web browser back in the early 1990s. This is back when people mostly didn't have web browsers. Uh, they didn't have computers that had a graphics card. Uh, their processor speeds on their computers were measured in megahertz with an M, not gigahertz, right? And nobody had broadband. This was like dial-up modems that went squeak and squawk, right? So this was a really early experiment in doing you know, virtual reality, but on a flat screen um, over the Internet. And needless to say, that was also a little bit early. Um, we, we had tens of millions of people using the technology, but it didn't really take off commercially because you kind of needed a fast connection and a really expensive computer. But, you know, we learned a heck of a lot. So that, that whole thing happened during the 1990s. It was a really interesting learning exercise. And here we are now, uh, 15 years after that, and uh, we have consumer virtual reality. We have hardware that can do it. We're all connected on broadband, like all the time, 24/7. We have super fast computers, and we have this, you know, 3D rendering technology now with virtual reality head-mounted displays and you know motion input and all this exciting new hardware. Uh, so wow, I'm glad I'm still alive to see this and get a chance to work on it again. I'm, I'm working in virtual reality right now as we speak. And I'm, ass I'm assuming because at that time, the tech industry was new. I still believe that there's definitely this influx of a cultural uh, lifestyle of music, sex, drugs, and rock and roll of San Francisco Bay Area and Silicon Valley. I'm sure that played a lot into it as well, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you'd be out, you know, at some party somewhere in some strange place in San Francisco and someone would be walking around and domination gear and someone else would say oh that's my CFO yeah <laughs> right it's some internet startup right, right? so there's definitely a bit of that you know kink and and wildlife that goes on in the Bay Area that that was intertwined with uh, San Francisco tech scene back then and I, I venture to guess you know I'm a little older now I have a kid I'm all settled down but I venture to guess it's not that different these days in the Bay Area and other tech hubs um, I see a running theme that, you know, there is a want and need to kind of alter perceptions in altered states. Um, do you th think that that was kind of also the motivation of VRML, like at those early times? You know, how much did that play into the influence? Well, in general, tech entrepreneurs, at least a subset of them, seem to be the kind of folks who are the same kind of folks who are willing to experiment with their own consciousness. That's right. Right? And if you're willing to do that, to take risks and take a mind-altering substance and challenge your perceptions and, you know, your set beliefs and get out of that box a little bit, you're probably the same kind of person who thinks, well, maybe I can actually reinvent the way people do things in the world. Hmm. Maybe I can create something brand new that's going to change people's lives somehow. Those two things seem to go hand in glove. That's right. Let's talk about some of the new stuff that you're working on today. Okay, so having this background in virtual reality, uh, it wasn't too surprising that once VR started hitting big over the last year, consumer VR, uh, companies are forming, investors are getting interested in the space and wanting to start new startups, that I was approached uh, to help with a venture fund's accelerator program. So Rothenberg Ventures, based in San Francisco, VC firm, the millennial VC fund, they call themselves, you know, young folks with a lot of energy in new technology areas, got interested in virtual reality, invested in a few companies, and they got really excited and decided to start an accelerator. So um, they put together a program where they picked 13 companies and invested a little bit of seed money into each one, kind of like Y Combinator style uh, model. And, and Y Combinator, a, as you, is, is some of the audience may not know, is an incubator where they're bringing f fresh innovators, building technology, and molding them to be the next big thing. 
Exactly. And so Rothenberg has done that for virtual reality, and they seeded 13 companies in the first round of doing this. And they're not just doing VR gaming, and they're really across the board. It's interesting. There's a couple of companies doing games. There's a few companies doing cinema type mm -hmm. of VR, you know, video. And then there's folks building applications like in healthcare and education and a broad, broad range of stuff. And they're actually from all over the world, too. they representing six continents. So this yeah. is fabulous. A worldwide, across-the-board kind of bet into VR that this is going to be a medium that changes everything. So long story short, they came and found me and asked me to be one of the mentors because of my background in virtual reality. That's right. And I accepted. I was really excited about it. And when they asked me to do that, I said, oh, and hey, by the way, I see your co-working space there. Can I get a desk there? <laughs> and so they offered me a desk as well. And so I'm a tenant there in the co-working space surrounded by people doing virtual reality. Can you explain you know, to our audience what 3D Web Fest is all about? So about seven months ago, um, Jim Quancy, who runs the Autodesk Developer Network, was really excited. Autodesk has a lot of 3D products for making you know, engineering, doing engineering, doing design, doing 3D animation, gaming. And Jim was saying, well, now we have WebGL everywhere. We can render 3D in a browser everywhere, even your, your smartphone. It's on iOS now, and mobile Safari. It's on mobile Chrome. It's on all the desktop platforms. And people are creating incredible creations with it. And because it's built into a browser, it's not like you have this business model need anymore where you have to say, oh, I'm going to build an e-commerce application to justify the great cost of creating 3D content and then trying to get a 3D plugin or some downloadable application onto a user's desk. It's right there in the browser. Yeah. And when it's right there in the browser, people can copy and paste and steal JavaScript code and they can just start creating amazing art. So the artists that are just enabled to do creations without the need to justify it, you know, in a business model, spinning a tennis shoe around That's in a web page right. or whatever, they can make whatever they want. Infinite landscapes, procedurally generated art, some stuff that was amazing by Isaac Cohen of Leap Motion. We're both big it's fans cool of stuff. Isaac, right? Yeah. Yeah, and we ended up getting 40 submissions for this art show. It was all about the art, nothing commercial. It was sponsored by commercial companies who also want to support this. And we got 350 people to pack the foundry, the Folsom Street Foundry in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Big screen projections of the art and 17 amazing demos. We got about 50 worldwide submissions. And I don't know, we should just talk about a couple of them. You were yeah. there. There was this, uh, someone who created these two giant mountains. Mountains that, that would you would tweet to a certain hashtag, and it would do text to speech, and the mountain would speak like this. In like, real time. In real time, yeah. as you tweeted. All kinds of crazy stuff was coming. The audience was tweeting it. Weird stuff was coming in, and I'd rather not repeat. <laughs> and it was fabulous. Or just giant data landscapes, or, or the finale piece of Wei Dong Yang and his group done Kinetech, Kinetech Arts. Powerful stuff. Which, which was. Data-driven, there was a, either Twitter or Facebook information just generating pixelated impressionistic data, and then a woman dancing, waving her arms with leap motions and standing on a pad and interacting with the data that, as it was happening live on the screen. It was absolutely incredible and 100% useless, which was the best part that of was the, the whole thing. That was the best part. It's art, you know, it, for it its own like sake. It show. doesn't need an explanation. It was like a rock show. People were clapping. I mean, it was just like, wow, this is happening now in the browser, and people are just moved by that because we've seen that grow, and this is where we're at today. You absolutely. Know? And you can get all that stuff in VR, too. That's the real promising That's stuff. Right. A few of the demos were in VR. And I, right. I can't wait to see more of those kind of come into an immersive environment. You know, we were just seeing them projected up on the screens, That's and that right. was fabulous. But, you know, people should be able to enjoy that stuff in an immersive environment, too. And, and you can do that in WebGL as well. So I'm, right. I'm really excited for maybe next year we'll have a web fest that has more VR art in it, too. Yeah. That'll be fabulous. That'll be really cool. You have also a lot of close-knit family and friends who help putting the, to get the event together as well. Oh, yeah. That's like, I mean, WebGL and WebVR has become a bit of a family. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people who we're probably seeing a little too much of each other because we're going to meetups once a week mm -hmm. and, and all that. And, you know, you, you go around SVVR and you see a lot of the same faces. But uh, that community thing is a lot of what's driving, you know, the innovation and in art that's going on right now. It's, you know, people would think, you know, big studios and big checks being written by rich people and all that. But it's not. There's a lot about people like us just talking and yeah. coming up with ideas and saying let's work on something together. Totally. Um, Tony, I wanted to, first of all, thank you for your time. Um, it was really great to know who you are as a person and some of the cool stuff that you're working on. So thank you for being part of the VR Report. Back at you. Thank you very much, David. Thank you so much. Kamsamida.